time on, after Peter confessed that Jesus, Jesus was the Messiah, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and undergo great suffering at the hands of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and on the third day be raised. And Peter looked, took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this must never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their lives will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit them if they gain the whole world, but forfeit their life? Or what will they give in return for their life? For the Son of Man is to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay everyone for what they have done. Truly I tell you, there are some standing here who will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. So one minute, uh, Jesus is saying to Peter, you're the rock for which I will build my church. And then in the next, he's calling Peter a stumbling block. So poor Peter has gone from this cornerstone to a stumbling block that fast. So what happened to Peter? Well, last week we said that there is a difference between knowledge and understanding. And Peter has some knowledge, but he shows us that he doesn't have full understanding. So up to this point, Jesus has spent much of his time addressing his, the crowds, working miracles, healing others, and this verbal jousting with the scribes and the Pharisees. And now Jesus moves to spend some one-on-one -on -one teaching time with those in his inner circle, preparing them for Jerusalem and the cross. So remember last week, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And the disciples answered, some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then he asked them, but what about you? Who do you say that I am? And that's when Peter answers, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, yes, exactly. That's exactly who I am. I'm the son of man and the son of God, fully human, fully divine. You know exactly who I am. And you know this not because it was revealed by humans, but because it was revealed by God. God the Creator spoke knowledge into his heart to know who he was. And because he knew that, Jesus says, my church will be built on this rock of knowledge. So Jesus knows that his disciples know through divine knowledge in their hearts and their minds who he is. And so he goes to tell them how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer. To suffer many things at the hands of the elders and the Pharisees and the scribes and how he'll be killed and on the third day be raised to life. And Peter has just professed with pretty great authority who Jesus is. And he and the others have heard that the church will be built on that foundation. And now they're hearing the words that Jesus will go to Jerusalem. He'll suffer and die and rise again to life. And so Peter explains, God, God forbid it, Lord. This must never happen to you. And I suspect that Peter was hearing the words suffer and die. And he didn't compute the last words. It said, rise again to life. And if he did, the word suffer and die was a path that he didn't want to travel. And who would? 
my goodness. I don't know about you, but I don't want to kind of get through this life on the path of least resistance. I prefer to hit that promised land with as easy a road as possible. It hasn't worked out so far for me yet, but we all want that path of least resistance. The road that passes through Jerusalem to the cross is hard and it's bloody and painful and who wants that? When Roland and I are cycling, I really like those really fat, flat trails. I could go forever on those flat trails, but he likes to throw in some hills. And I like to stay on the flats. But if we're not challenging ourselves to the hills, we don't get stronger. We don't get more fit. We don't have the experience we could because what goes up must come down on other side, right? Too often we look for the path of least resistance. So Jesus rebukes Peter and says with forth, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block for me. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So Peter is putting really his own interest first. Peter's not seeing and hearing the redemption of the cross. Rather, he hears and fears the pain and the cost it will take to get there. So what happened to Peter to go from a cornerstone to a stumbling block? Peter is reaching out of his humanness out of his limited earthly knowledge, out of his fears and doubts, rather than a place of faith that he professed just a short while ago. So Jesus uses this as a pivotal teaching moment for his disciples and for us. Jesus begins to teach all who are gathered the truth of being a follower of Jesus Christ. He says, if you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. We're not to lead, we are to follow. It doesn't say, if you want to become my leader, then deny yourself and take up your cross and lead me. Jesus says, we are to follow. He is to lead us. We are not to look with our own earthly eyes to the path of least resistance, but we're called to seek with our eyes of faith the path for which God is calling us to travel, the path that leads to the cross of redemption. That is the path we are called to walk, knowing in our hearts and minds the divine knowledge of who Jesus truly is, our Redeemer, our Savior, and our Lord. Jesus never shies away from the hard road, and in following him, we're not to shy away from it either. One of my seminary professors once said, he says, life will give you enough crosses to bear, and when life challenges, disappointments, and suffering come, Disciples and followers of Christ embody certain behaviors to bear those burdens and the burdens of others. What are those certain behaviors that followers of Christ display? One of those behaviors is helping others. Maybe when it's not convenient to delay our schedule, to slow down long enough to be an ear, to truly listen. It's asking how is your day going and be willing to listen for the real answer. To be an ear willing to hear the real answer. It's putting one's own interest down the list to tend to the needs of others. I had a wonderful friend, Wanda Foster. She died of breast cancer, but when she was 
in hospice care at uh, Living Center East in her final months. There was a lady uh, that she shared the dinner table with. And this lady was frankly quite rude to Wanda. Wanda had had a stroke through all this process and so food would kind of come out the one side of her mouth and be a little messy. And this lady would always tell Wanda, stop that, it's messy. And so instead of Wanda being put down by that, she saw a lady that was angry about something. And she found out that this lady didn't have a lot of family. <clears throat> she also noticed, <coughs> grab some water, that she wore a sweater with holes in it. And so she knew <clears throat> from one of the nurses that this lady's uh, birthday was coming up. So she asked, Wanda asked one of the nurses to take $40 <coughs> and to go buy her a new sweater for her birthday. In hospice care, stage four breast cancer, thinking about others and acting. It's the behavior of a follower of Christ. <clears throat> you know, it's giving the grumpy sales clerk who's having a hard day for reasons unknown to us the benefit of the doubt. It's sitting with those in those hard, cold bleachers on a windy, rainy day when you really wish you were in your recliner at home, but your presence to that young person is everything. That's a behavior of a follower of Christ. It's saying and claiming that I trust the Lord that you're here with me, whether I am beside the still waters or if I'm walking through the valley of death. It's being a trusted friend. These are behaviors of followers of Christ. Psalm 21, 121 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. It's really embodying the words of Paul that we heard Carl read for us today. Let love be genuine. Hate what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with mutual affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not lag in zeal. Be ardent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Extend hospitality to strangers. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Do not claim to be wiser than you are. Do not repay anyone for evil, but take thought for what is noble in the sight of all. If it is possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Paul encompasses the behaviors of what it is to be a follower of Christ. Jesus told Peter, you're setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And it's this dichotomy between focusing on what we see with our earthly eyes in this life to seeing the promises that come with the cross and what Jesus did for us through his suffering. We have to ask, are we be, being directed by our fears and our doubts? Or are we being directed by the promise of God through Christ and the Holy Spirit? It is absolutely certain that life gives us challenges, disappointments, and suffering. It comes with life on this earth because we're not perfect. We're sinful. We live in a broken world. But we are people of hope because Jesus came to give us life and life abundantly. 
And when we follow him in our suffering and despite our suffering, we embody certain behaviors that help us to bear our burdens and the burdens of others. So a couple questions to ponder this week. How have others helped you bear your burdens? And the other question, how have you helped others to face their burdens, their challenges, their disappointments, the hard things in life? How have others helped you bear their burdens and your burdens, and how have you helped others face theirs? The Derecho Storm is a perfect example in the last three weeks of how you have helped Roland and I bear our burdens through prayer, through being there. And how have we helped others bear theirs? We thank God every time that we have others that come to us to help bear our burdens. We praise God in those moments. And we praise God when we can do that for others. We receive and we give. It's the rhythm of life. And that's what Jesus was trying to get through to his disciples. His cost on the cross gives us the ability to praise God when we need help and when we receive help. And do that for others. It's what the followers of Christ do. Amen.